Hi, everyone. My name is Deborah Krieger. I'm the exhibit and program coordinator at the Museum of Work and Culture. Uh, thank you all for coming to this program. Um, Family Memories, a conversation about camp and its aftermath. It's part of the current exhibition at Museum of Work and Culture, Writing or Wrong, Japanese Americans in World War II. That exhibition closes uh, after March 31st. So if you're local and you wanna come check it out, please do, that would be great. Um, this program is sponsored by the New England Japanese American Citizens League who sponsored uh, our other programs as well. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, so I will now uh, introduce our moderator, Erin Aoyama, who I could not have done the exhibition without and who none of the programs also could have happened without either. Uh, Aoyama is a doctoral candidate in American studies at Brown University. Her research is rooted in a Asian American studies, 20th century American history, relational ethnic studies, and public humanities. Her dissertation takes up questions of race, place, and community repair within the afterlives of Japanese American incarceration, incarceration and redress. Over to you. Thank you so much, Deborah. This is such a delight to be here with all of you with so many familiar faces and names. Um, I actually made my way to Woonsocket last week from Providence and saw the exhibit and it is really fantastic. The museum as a whole is a really wonderful place to visit. So I would encourage all of you who are in Rhode Island and the surrounding areas to, to be there. Um, and now I'm so delighted to introduce Margie Yamamoto, who will share some of her family stories with us. Margie is retired now after more than 40 years in the marketing and communications fields. Before retirement, she was director of community program initiatives at WGBH, Boston's public broadcasting station. She served on the boards of the Japan Society of Boston and the Cambridge Center for Adult Education. Yamamoto has also served on advisory committees for the PBS Adult Learning Service, the Greater Boston Food Bank and the Institute for Asian American Studies at UMass Boston. I will say, um, please, please put questions or thoughts in the chat as we go. We'll hear from first Margie and then David, and then we'll have a conversation. Um, so if you have things you'd like to ask our speakers, please, please put those in the chat and I will keep track of them. So with that, Margie, I will turn things over to you. Thank you, Aaron. I've really been looking forward to today because this is a different way for us to talk about camp because usually, you know, we just talk about what happened and everything. I will be doing some of that in my talk, but at the same time, I'm going to be interjecting more personal stories of what happened. But in order to tell you my family's story, I have to first introduce you to two Japanese words that I'll be using. Now, let me get my screen share. Oops, that's the wrong one there. And here we go. I know meant for many of you, this is old hat and you know these terms, but some of you might not know them. We have words in Japanese to describe the generations of Japanese living in America. The first word is issei. This is the immigrant generation who was first came to America and was born in Japan. Nisei means second generation. They're the children of the issei, were born in America and are American citizens. The key players in my family story are my parents, Kinuko and Sohei Yamamoto. Kinuko, my mother, is a Nisei, and Sohei, my father, is an Issei. We'll start by meeting Kinuko. Here she is at the age of 11. She was born and raised in Hilo, Hawaii. This is her family. Only an older brother is missing from the picture. Her parents came to Hawaii in 1897 from a small village in Japan near Hiroshima. They came over as contract laborers for one of the sugarcane plantations in Hawaii. They saved their money and they started their own business, a bakery, one that catered to the plantation workers. It was a family run business, so all the kids were expected to help, Kinuko included. Here's Kinuko as a teenager, the second from the left. When she was in the eighth grade, her father died suddenly. And although she had an older brother, it was she who was expected to quit school and work in the bakery. When she turned 18, the age of marriage back then, her mother began to get proposals for her. Her response each time was a loud and emphatic no. When that's her in the white hat with friends in the middle of a sugarcane field. 
She continued to dodge marriage because she said she wasn't interested in any of the local boys. Her mother and all the relatives were beginning to fear that she would never marry. Then an unexpected letter arrived that changed everything. Her cousin in California wrote telling her, I found a husband for you. The young man was Sohei Yamamoto. He came to California in 1926 from a small fishing village in Japan. This was during the time of the Asian Exclusion Act that barred all Asians from immigrating to the United States. Ever resourceful, he sailed to Mexico, joined a group of migrant Mexican tomato pickers and walked into California. Yes, he was an early illegal alien. The couple exchanged photos and letters and just two, two weeks, two months, I'm sorry, later, Kinuko was sailing on a ship to California. She arrived on October 17th, stayed with her cousin, and then on November 5th, little more than two and a half weeks later, they were married. They were able to gather the few friends and relatives they had in Los Angeles for a wedding celebration. Many years later, I asked her how she felt marrying a man she hardly knew. She told me, I didn't want to worry my mother anymore. So I took a deep breath, closed my eyes, and I got married. As they began planning for the future, the year was 1931, and the country was in the middle of the Great Depression. Jobs were scarce and money very tight. They heard about a place called Terminal Island, where there was work and opportunities for Japanese people. Terminal Island is an actual island located in the middle of Los Angeles Harbor. Harbor. The population of Terminal Island was primarily Japanese and Japanese Americans who lived and worked there. The men of Terminal Island were fishermen. They fished for the tuna and mackerel that was so plentiful off the California coast. Their wives worked in the canneries processing the fish they caught. My parents opened a grocery store to serve the Terminal Island families and became part of this unique community made up of approximately 30,000 Issei and Nisei, first and second generation Japanese. The island included everything, restaurants, hotels, bars, schools, churches, doctors, everything needed to build a self-sufficient little town. Over the next 10 years, my parents added three children, my oldest sister, Shinko Shirley, and my brothers, Hajime James and Tadashi Teddy. The family and the grocery store thrived. My father added a ship channelry to his business serving Japanese freighters and passenger ships. But then everything changed. When on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and the United States declared war on, Japanese in, on Japan. Terminal Island's location played an important role in what happened next. Let's take a look at a map. Here's Terminal Island. Los Angeles is directly to the north, and an army installation was located in San Pedro to the west. A major naval station was being established in nearby Long Beach to the east, and poor Terminal Island was right in the middle. Within hours of the Pearl Harbor attack, the FBI descended on Terminal Island and began picking up community and religious leaders and many of the men who owned commercial fishing boats. Terminal Island's location and the men's access to boats made them suspected of helping the enemy. Because he had a ship chandlery and sold supplies to Japanese ships before the war, they had already thoroughly investigated him and they didn't feel he posed a threat so he was not picked up. This is my father, I'm sorry. The other Issei and Nisei men on Terminal Island were not as lucky. In the end, almost every adult Japanese man on Terminal Island was taken into custody by the FBI and the families didn't see them again for months and in some cases for years. Not a single one of these men was ever found to have committed an act of sabotage against the United States. As America entered the war, the national press quickly began carrying stories and photos to inflame anti-Japanese sentiments. Unfortunately, headlines like these 
cause those negative sentiments to spill over into the Issei and Nisei. Even the beloved Dr. Seuss became involved with a cartoon like this, showing the Japanese on the West Coast lining up to be issued dynamite with which to commit acts of sabotage. Just two weeks after Pearl Harbor, Life magazine featured a detailed story telling readers how to tell the difference between Chinese and Japanese. The faces they used were of a Chinese public servant in the top photo and General Tojo, the prime minister of Japan on the bottom. There was a diagram of both faces and the Chinese were described as being relatively tall and slender with parchment yellow skin and a long and delicately boned face. The Japanese, on the other hand, were squat, had a massively boned head and face, flat nose, and yellow ochre skin. I don't know where Life magazine found its information, but it was riddled with ne negative stereotypes. Many people, however, were directing their hatred and anger toward all Asians. To protect themselves, some Chinese used homemade signs like this or wore armbands stating, I am Chinese. The Japanese used buttons and signs like this one, stating, I am an American. On February 19th, mm -hmm. President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, giving the military total control over the Western states. He signed it over the objections of Attorney General Francis Biddle and FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, both of whom felt the order was unconstitutional and unnecessary. Just six days after that presidential order was signed, we were the first group affected. The 3,000 residents of Terminal Island received orders delivered by armed soldiers, telling us that we had 48 hours to leave our homes and businesses and evacuate the island. With few exceptions, the only people left were women, teenagers, and children. Most of the men on Terminal Island had already been arrested by the FBI. Despite the requirement of the presidential order that transportation, food, shelter, and accommodations be provided those removed from an area, no such provisions were made for our relocation. The only help came from family, friends, and churches. My parents' friends and relatives came with trucks and cars and helped to empty our store of what could not be sold. Terminal Island became a ghost town. We moved to an apartment in Boyle Heights, a Japanese community in Los Angeles. Then just 12 days after our forced mm -hmm. evacuation, my mother gave birth to me, wow. her last child. About one month later, the first of a series of mass evacuation orders were issued to the rest of the West Coast Japanese with a goal of removing all persons of Japanese ancestry from the Western military zone as soon as possible. That involved 120,000 people. This military zone ran along the Western states from Arizona all the way up the coast to Washington. Because it was impossible to build the more permanent camps quickly, the Japanese were first taken to 15 temporary detention centers mostly in California, where they were confined at racetracks and state fairgrounds. My father closely monitored the areas in California as they were being closed to us, and he would move the whole family to another area that was still open. He tried to keep us out and free for as long as he could. When they finally caught up with us, we re received orders for the Turlock Detention Center in Central California. We were told to bring only what we could carry with us. For our family, it was especially difficult because my mother could only carry me, a two month old infant and a few supplies. The other children were too young to be of much help. My poor father had to carry as much as he could for a family of six. Mm. In the meantime, the permanent incarceration camps, euphemistically called relocation centers, were being built and were scattered across the states. There were 10 camps located in California, Arizona, Utah, Idaho, Colorado, Wyoming, and as far east as Arkansas. The irony of this was there were Japanese already living in some of these states and they were not imprisoned. 
from that temporary center in California, we were taken by train to our permanent camp. We arrived at Gila River, Arizona on July 28, 1942. The camp was located in the middle of the Arizona desert. At its peak occupancy, Gila River housed 13,348 people, making it the fourth largest city in the state of Arizona. Our family was housed in a tar, black tar paper covered barrack that was divided into four living units. So our family of six lived in a space 20 by 25 feet in size. What everyone remembers was the ever present sandstorms, as you can see in this sketch by Nisei artist, Mine Okubo. These hastily constructed barracks were made with green lumber that shrank in the hot Arizona sun. The sand invaded the barracks through gaps between the lumber, and my mother had to put layers of cheesecloth over my crib to protect me. Here's a typical unit. When we arrived, they were empty except for army cots, and we had to make our own furniture from scrap lumber. The partition between each family's living space was open at the top, which meant absolutely no privacy for anyone. That lack of privacy even extended to the showers and the toilets. These facilities were built military style with separate latrines and showers for men and women. That didn't help us in using these facilities though. There were so many people that there were lines for everything from mess hall lines to lines for the latrine and showers or to do your laundry. You might stand in some lines for hours. This is a typical mess hall where we ate all our meals we lived in Gila River under these conditions for nearly two years. By 1944, the government began to allow families and individuals to leave if they stayed out of the Western military zone. My uncle lived in Denver, had his own business and agreed to be our sponsor. This picture was taken just before we left Gila River on April 21st, 1944. And it's the only picture I have of me as a baby. Since our cameras were confiscated right after the war broke out, we have very few pictures from this period. When we left the camp, we were given a one-way bus ticket to Denver and $25 per person. Our trip to Denver resulted in our exposure to what some Japanese Americans were already experiencing outside the camps. We weren't greeted by signs like this one or this but it was an indication of what we might expect. For the trip to Denver, most of the family took the bus, but my father and my eight-year-old brother traveled by car with our uncle and all our belongings. On the road, they stopped at a small town diner to, for lunch. Before they were finished eating, they suddenly realized word had gotten out about their presence and a crowd was forming at the entrance to the diner. They had to be escorted out the back door for their safety. When we all arrived in Denver, we felt relatively safe being among family. But one day I went to the post office with my mother. I, I must have been about two and a half years old. We were waiting in line to buy stamps when suddenly a woman saw us and began pointing and chanting loudly over and over, two for penny japs. We left quickly without our stamps. Soon after, my parents decided to leave Denver and we were on the road again, this time to Chicago, where the government was encouraging many Japanese from the camps to settle. We opened a restaurant in what was becoming the Japanese section of town and called it the Gila River Inn, so anyone coming out of the camps could find us. The year after the war ended, we left Chicago, made a quick stop in Denver, and we moved, moved back to California. We found a house in Compton, California. Mom told me it cost $8,000. It had two bedrooms and one bath, a luxury for us since we hadn't lived in a real house since Terminal Island. We four kids were in heaven with a large backyard and other kids to play with nearby. Back then, our part of Compton was mixed racially, and there were four or five other Japanese American families living on our street. 
Dad joined his brother who moved his business from Denver and mom went to work in a showing, sewing factory doing piecework, which meant she was paid not by the hour, but for each item she sewed. Dad and mom saved their money and opened another grocery store, Aloha Market in Gardena, California. When, when Japanese ships began to trade in the port of Los Angeles again, dad restarted the ship chandlery and over the years, the business expanded and moved twice and eventually looked like this. It was operated by my oldest brother, Jim, until he retired in 2012. My other brother, Tant, went on to be a lawyer. My sister, Shirley, was widowed early and worked with Jim in the family business. When dad was 75, I gave him a copy of a Japanese translation of America's concentration camps. Now, it's not the best book about our experience, but it was the only one I could find that was translated into Japanese. This was the first time he had seen anything like this in print in a language he could read easily. He had spent more than 33 years feeling the guilt and shame of our imprisonment and never saw anything that told him what happened to him was unjust. After he read the book, he asked me to please get him more books in Japanese like that one. He was ill with cancer at the time and passed away the next year, and I was never able to find him more books. Twelve years after Dad's death, President Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, granting reparations to Japanese who had been incarcerated during World War II. It resulted in a payment of $20,000 in a letter of apology from the sitting president. I was visiting my mother a few months after she was paid, and I asked her what she did with the money. Now, in my mother's house, she had a Buddhist altar in the living room where she put pictures of deceased relatives. Whenever we had a family celebration or dinner, she always put some of the food there so they could join in the festivities. She took me to this altar, and there, resting against dad's picture, was her uncashed check. She just wanted to be sure he knew. On her 88th birthday, our whole family gathered to celebrate. Mom's four kids were on hand. That's Jim on the left, the brother who took over the family business. Ted, the lawyer, is next. And me, when my hair was still all black. And my sister, Shirley. By then, Mom had a large, multiracial, multicultural family made up of four children, 14 grandchildren, 21 great-grandchildren, and eight great-great-grandchildren. That's mom standing right in the middle. Our story is just one of the many thousands to result from our World War II incarceration. We were very fortunate that we came out of this ex experience with the family healthy and intact. Many other families were not as lucky. And I just wish they could be here to tell you their stories. Thank you. Wow, Margie, thank you so much. That those photos are beautiful and just that's your family story is so powerful. Um, and I'm really looking forward to asking you some questions and, and talking more about it. Um, but thank you so much for sharing. Next, I'm so delighted to introduce David Sakura. David was born in Seattle, Washington, and he is a Sansei. So adding on to those generational terms that Margie introduced us to, Sansei is third generation Japanese American. Um, and David will tell us more about this, but his grandfather was a leader in Seattle's Japanese American community, Japanese community in the early 1900s. And at the outbreak of World War II, David and his family were sent first to Camp Harmony and then to Minidoka Camp in Idaho. So David, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your story. Um, and Deb will get the slides going as you begin. Sure. Aaron, thank you very much um, for that kind introduction. I have to uh, say that this is my second visit to Rhode Island. I was uh, invited by friends of ours, the Smiths, uh, to speak at one of their uh, functions. So this is a, uh, in a way, a coming home exercise for me. So thank you very much for inviting me. To begin with, uh, my story begins with my grandfather, who was born in a small mountain village on the western shore of the main island in Japan, the village Tsuano 
was a, uh, a place that is somewhat similar to um, uh, some of our homes here in uh, villages in New Hampshire, uh, surrounded by mountains and streams. It was a home of the samurai. In my grandfather was born in 1868 at the beginning of the Meiji Restoration when Japan was open to the West. And as a young man, he converted to Christianity and decided that he would like to live in the United States. So even as a teenager, he made the long trek to uh, Yokohama where he earned enough money for passage and arrived in Seattle in 1898. There he uh, worked for about a year, earning enough money for uh, sending for a picture bride. And so through a, uh, a contact, he identified a beautiful young woman from Akito Prefecture who agreed to marry him. And when she walked down the gangplank of the, of the ship arriving in Seattle, my grandmother said that love blossomed. And in fact, love indeed blossomed. In the subsequent, subsequent years, they had nine children, about two every, uh, one every two years. But unfortunately, my grandfather suffered an accident and passed away in 1919 from that accident. The, uh, before he passed away on, passed away, he brought his three boys, uh, around him and told them that he predicted that there would be a war between Japan and the United States. And he urged them to be loyal to the United States because this was their new home. My father, who is seated in this photograph, in the next photograph, who is seated in the next photograph, was just finishing high school and leaving this left my mother, grandmother, a widow. And as a result, the three, two older boys had to go out, leave home, travel around the country, earn enough money to support the family, which consisted at that time of nine, nine children, four boys and five girls. Fortunately, my uncle found employment at a nearby lumber company in Eatonville, Washington. In the next photograph, you see the photograph of the lumber mill in Eatonville. My uncle, as well as my father, joined the work crew in the mid-1920s. And by 1930, in the, in the midst of a Great Depression, my father had risen to the uh, position of foreman in one of the, uh, one of the mills and was in charge of the rest of the Japanese speaking men. About 50 of the 100 workmen in this mill in Eaton Mill were of Japanese origin. In the next photograph, we see the family gathered in, in the backyard of our home. In fact, we lived on, in company housing on the grounds of the mill and there were over a hundred Japanese and Japanese American families living in, in this community. It was a wonderful time of community. We had all the uh, uh, benefits of a Japanese community, including a bathhouse, a uh, tofu house, and we also celebrated many of the Japanese festivals. So it was a wonderful time of, of community, of friendship, and, and of family. And also it was a time of economic growth for my, my father. Uh, he was able to buy a new car uh, and we were beginning to climb up the social economic ladder, uh, fulfilling my grandfather's dream of coming to America. When World War II began in the next slide, uh, when World War II began, with the bombing of, of Pearl Harbor in December, life continued relatively normal. Here's a Christmas card my family sent out in December of 1941, 
just after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. The family tried to live a somewhat normal life, but as Margie indicated, there was a rising tension against Japanese and Japanese Americans, resulting in the signing of Executive Order 9066. Even after Executive 9066, we see in the next slide, my kindergarten photograph. I was just finishing up my first year in school at the Eatonville Elementary School. Uh, I was in, enrolled in kindergarten. And this photograph was taken in April 1941, two months after the signing of Executive Order 9066. So I can remember that life was somewhat normal, but I do remember my parents talking about what to do if we have to uh, relocate somewhere. And the decision was to take our chances, stay where we are, and to see what happens. Well, what happened was that we were ordered to report to a detention camp in Puyallup, Washington at the fairgrounds. And the next slide shows the last photograph of our life in Eatonville, Washington. What I like about this photograph is a picture of our dog, Puggy. My father and my mother had to sell all their goods, their car, put everything in storage, and we had to give Puggy away to a good friend. And we were told subsequently after the war that Puggy had waited for us at the, at the front door, waiting for us to come home. And of course, we never did return back to Eatonville. And the story goes that Puggy died of a broken heart. In the next slide is a photograph of the fairgrounds in Puyallup, Washington. I do remember quite vividly our arrival at the fairgrounds. Uh, in looking out the window of a Greyhound bus, I could see the, uh, a, a line of people pressed up against the barbed wire watching the new arrivals coming in. There were about 6,000 of us arriving in the uh, and living in Puyallup at the uh, detention center. We were given straw uh, bags, uh, bags to uh, fill up with straw and our quarters was a uh, horse stall. And I recall seeing my mother sitting in the corner holding my, my brother who was crying incessantly and I can still hear him crying and crying until he could make no further sound. And all I can remember now is that low animal sound that came out because he had gotten so hoarse. In the summer of 19, in the fall of 1942, in the next slide, is a photograph of our arrival on a train that was taking us as a group to our permanent relocation site in Minidoka. This photograph was taken by a government uh, photographer who uh, greeted us as we uh, arrived at, at the station. And I remember getting off the train and gr being greeted by an armed guard with a rifle. And he bent down to me and greeted me by name saying, hello, David. And I was puzzled. I, I didn't understand how he could know my name, but the government had issued name tags and numbers for all of us. And he was able to read my name off my name tag. This photograph is, uh, shows my, my brother, Jerry, who was the one that cried all the time, my younger brother, Chester Jr., and myself in the background. This was an arduous trip. It was over 30 hours long. It uh, seemed to creep along. We had to have the shades drawn. But I do remember late at night, I lifted the shades and peered out and I could smell the cool, clear, fresh air, desert air of the, of the Idaho countryside. And I saw a man standing under the streetlight looking at the train. I wondered to myself whether this man was thinking that we were prisoners of war heading off to a detention camp. In the next slide, I'll, uh, I'd like to show you a government photo uh, taken by a government uh, uh, photographer. In the spring of 1943, the government 
uh, began calling for volunteers to uh, enlist in the US Army. And my father and my three uncles all volunteered in mass. And so this photograph is a celebration of that volunteer effort by my uncles and my father, who was at that time uh, uh, 37 of eight years of age. And it was, I think, used as a publicity photo showing, showing the loyalty of the Japanese Americans and their, their, uh, their desire to, to help in the war effort. But in a way, this is a, a tragic photograph. And there's a lot of irony here. My aunt standing on the left, Aunt Alice, is a Funai. And her brother was a member of the US Army before the war, as when the war began, he was discharged from the army and then recalled and ended up fighting in, in Italy, in France with the uh, Jap all Japanese American 442nd Battalion. He was subsequently captured and put into a German POW camp. And this, the irony of this photograph is his sister, Alice, with her newborn baby, was also in a, in a POW camp of sorts, an American POW camp. Well, at the same time, her brother George was in a US, uh, was in a German uh, POW camp. <clears throat> I think a more realistic photograph is the next one. Which shows my father just prior to when he enlisted into the US Army. This photograph tells me, the, describes to me the horrific conditions that my family and myself lived under in these camps. The dust was perpetual, the freezing winters, the boiling hot summers, living in a one room uh, barracks with, uh, with three children, my mother, father, and grand grandmother. I I look at this and and try to picture myself living under these conditions. But more more poignant, I think, is the next photograph of my mother. This is a family portrait taken on a pile of rocks, with a barracks in the background, with dust on our clothes and mom, my mother trying to put on a, a good, good face. In fact, this was a very difficult time for my mother. She, uh, at one point, suffered what was called a nervous breakdown uh, because she had to manage the three boys as well as my grandmother living in the one-room barracks. My father, by this time, had enlisted in the Army and had left in May of 1943. And we wouldn't see him only intermittently for the next two and a half years until the end of the war. So my mother had to manage, manage the, uh, the boys. The next photograph shows my father on a rare visit back to the camp. During this visit, I remember my father telling me that I am now the man of the house and I should take care of my mother and my two younger brothers. I was seven or eight years old at the time. And when I think about it, it was, this was an impossible task for a seven year, eight year old. But I still have that memory in my mind and I still have very strong feelings of taking care of my brothers as well as the, the times that I spent with my mother. And you can see in the background, the roads were not, there were only muddy uh, roads that, uh, that were in the, the camps. I went to grade school, first grade in Minidoka and second grade at the Stafford Elementary School on the other end of camp. So I spent, we spent about two years um, in total living in Minidoka. The next slide shows one of our happier moments in the summer of 1943. Well, my father was training at basic training in Camp Shelby with the 442nd. A group of 30 of us were allowed to leave camp 
and to uh, spend two weeks at a Baptist church assembly in the Sawtooth Mountains of Idaho near Sun Valley. It was there that I remember I learned how to swim and it was a welcome relief from the, the tedious life in uh, living in Minidoka. One year later, in 1944, my mother received a, an indefinite leave to uh, leave the camp and to move to Wisconsin, where a farmer had, uh, had uh, agreed to be our sponsor. So my mother, my mother took the three boys and uh, boarded the train, as Margie said, given a $25 cash and a one-way ticket. And she made her way to uh, a farm in the middle of uh, Wisconsin, near Madison, Wisconsin. I remember getting off the Greyhound bus, we, walking up the long driveway to the farmhouse. And we thought that this was a welcome relief from the camps, but only to find out that we were housed in a migrant uh, accommodations. And my mother was faced with uh, being a housekeeper at the, at the farm. Something seemed to happen during that very short stay. My mother called my father uh, urgently to come and take us out of the farm. And we moved then quickly to a, uh, an apartment in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 100 miles away. And this is the apartment that uh, we lived in in the next slide. Um, it was a converted office building and we had a one room studio apartment, not much bigger than the, the uh, room that we had in the barracks, but it was actually out of the camps and we were on our way uh, living in Milwaukee. During this time in 1944, we, uh, the, there was a, epidemic of polio. And I remember in a staying sequestered, quarantined in that one room studio apartment with my two brothers, my grandmother, while my mother was working as a, uh, as a cook in a nearby hotel. So we spent the entire summer of 1944 uh, quarantined in a one room studio in this converted office building in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The subsequent year, we improved our accommodations. And in the next slide, we moved uptown in Milwaukee, still on the main in, in the downtown area. And we actually had a two bedroom apartment. And it was here that I attended uh, third grade. My, uh, and uh, my brothers attended uh, um, nursery school from here. After about a year, we then moved to Park Lawn, which is shown in the next slide. And we finally had a two bedroom apartment that uh, had all the features of being at home. A home. It was uh, in an idyllic uh, setting where there were parks, ball fields, community center, all the, all the attributes of a, of a nice public housing home. My father then came home from the war and a year later in 1947, my, my third brother was born and there we lived until 1951 when my father bought his first house in a nearby neighborhood. The first house was, was bought for about $16,000. And I had to donate part of my newspaper money for uh, the down payment of our house. But this is the first house my father ever owned. And this was 10 years after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> Here we lived and went to uh, school, went to elementary, 
high school and then off to college. <clears throat> and this was my last permanent home in Milwaukee. But we finally, as a family, after being interned in Minidoka, after being uprooted and, and, and uh, sent to Wisconsin, this is our first permanent home and we never decided to uh, move back to Seattle. Although that was part of the discussion almost every summer. And my father decided to put down his roots uh, and uh, this is where we went to high school and then subsequently went on to college. So this, this is the end of our, our story. And uh, I'd like to give it back to Aaron and maybe we can talk about subsequent to the, uh, to the war and what happened to the Japanese Americans. Yes, thank you so much, David. Thank you, Deborah, also for running those slides. Um, it's so powerful to hear both of you talk about your parents in the way that you do and their stories. And, you know, it's clear that you've done a lot of reflecting on what it was like for them to have small children um, and, and be going through this. I'm wondering, and Margie, I'll direct this question to you first and David give you a little bit of a break um, from speaking, but did you ever talk with your parents or your siblings, your family after camp about your experience during the war? Yes, I did. Um, not immediately. I, I didn't really get into it all until I was in my 30s. And I was in graduate school. I, I you know, graduated when I was 21 and all this and went out and worked, but um, decided I, I wanted more education. So at the age of 30, I went back to graduate school. And this was about the time that Asian American studies were just starting up. I was at San Jose State in California. And um, I took a class about the camps and the teacher was Helen Mineta, Norm Mineta's sister. And, um, and it was a wonderful class. And I never questioned any of this um, as a child growing up or even as a young adult. Um, to me, the only thing was whenever I had history class in high school, in junior high school, I would sit there and start when they got to World War II in history class, I would start sinking in my seat because I thought everyone was looking at me. And, um, and in those days, the history books still said J-A-P, not Japanese. And um, there was a friend in, in, this was in high school and, and so brave. Uh, at one point, the teacher used that word, the three letter word, and he, got up, he looked at her and he said, shame on you, Mrs. Miller. And he walked out of the class. <laughs> I wish I was brave enough to do it too. I just sank deeper into my seat. But um, I began, so when I finally found out more about the camps, because up to that point, I'm 30 years old and I didn't know all this stuff. This is back in 1971. And um, I did ask, my mother more than my father because my father spoke mostly Japanese and my Japanese did not work very well. And um, she told me stories about it, which, which were not horror stories. She would say things like, you know, that was the only time I didn't have to work. So I got to just take care of you. <laughs> and and I, I said, oh, is that why I'm so spoiled? You know, <laughs> but, um, um, and I never had an opportunity to ask my father or talk to him. It wasn't until later after he died that um, I became even more curious because I was um, working on the family history. And I realized that um, with the way all of our families go and everybody in my family was marrying out of the Japanese community. And um, so the, my nephews and nieces were not getting our history. So I decided I better write it down. So then I just started doing more research and I did ask my mother about it. So the, some of the details that I was able to get about what happened to us during the evacuation is from her. I've talked to my brothers and sisters and I would get stories like the boys would tell me, oh, we had playmates all the time. I would just go and play. I just had a great time. And you know that was their thing. But my sister told me one story that, that stuck with me about when we were probably going to the um, detention camps and we had to 
we could only carry what we could carry with us. And uh, my father had to carry everything he could carry. So he had cloth around his neck with two suitcases at each end. He had a suitcase under each arm and two suitcases in his hands. And then all these kids, the, the four, the three kids and my mother carrying me. And they had to walk through town to get to wherever they were going. And she said, there were people on either side of the street just watching us. And she said, she was nine years old at the time. She said, I was scared. And, um, you know, I, so I, I, that picture is, uh, stayed with me. And, um, but other than that, those are mostly the stories I got. And, um, um, and, and some of the things I did learn about it, I had to read in history books because I didn't get all the details. But yes, I did talk to people about it. Yeah, no, but I, I mean, even that experience of needing to take a class to then be able to ask these questions of your family about your own experience and your own childhood, I think, I mean, I can definitely relate to that. <laughs> that has been my experience too. But the, the importance of being able to learn how to ask these questions, even though, you know, you were, you were in camp yourself, but you were a baby. These are, you know, not memories that you have. Yeah. And, oh. and I think all of us, you share this uh, whole thing. The Nisei didn't like to talk about it. They didn't tell us about these things. The Nisei I knew as friends never told me about this stuff. Right. And um, I don't know if there was some shame and guilt associated with the experience. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there was. Because, yeah, I mean, it was a horrible thing to happen, and you didn't do anything to make it happen. And, right. and um, well, I, I don't know how I would have reacted if I were a 21-year-old when it happened. I don't know. Right. right. And I think I've been thinking about that. My grandmother was 20 when she was sent oh. to camp. And so, and I started learning about this history when I was 20 also, just sort of coincidentally, but it's been a process of, I think, coming to realize that I think a lot of the reasons why she never talked about this was also to protect, you know, my dad and to protect us from not having to come to terms in the same way with that shame or that guilt or whatever, you know, alongside wanting to move forward and wanting to, you know, give future generations of her family as normal a life as possible. But yeah. I'd like to hear David because he had a Nisei father, whereas right. I had an Issei father, which was a whole different story. I'd, right. I'd like to hear David's answer to that question. Well, in, in some ways, Margie, uh, my story is very similar to yours. Uh, I think in my 40s, uh, I, I went to college and I went to uh, graduate school and was not too interested in my Japanese heritage until I got to Boston. And I, I took a series of Japanese literature courses at the Harvard Extension. And it really began to impress on me that I really have a Japanese heritage. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there was a nascent movement for redress by uh, the Japanese community on the West Coast. And you were involved in that nascent movement in the early 70s. And by the time I, I was in my late 40s, early 50s, there was a rumbling here in Boston, especially amongst the uh, college students at Harvard and other, other universities about banding together and talking about being Japanese, but also focusing on this idea of redress. Mm -hmm. So, in, in 1978, a group of college students, as well as some, uh, some Japanese Nisei from the community, uh, got together in a series of informal meetings, mm -hmm. and we gave ourselves, the group gave itself the name of Jane, or that is Japanese Americans in New England, and a series of of, of meetings were held. And some of the language was reminiscent of the, the protest, the Vietnam era protests, uh, the civil rights movement in the 1960s. And some of the language that we were, was used during these Jane, uh, Jane meetings was consciousness raising, looking at your heritage, being proud of your heritage. 
And I remember for the first time at one of the Jane meetings, I began to talk about my internment experience as a child. And um, I can say that it was very painful. And subsequent meetings, other, other uh, Sansei and Nisei got up and began to talk about their uh, internment experience. And I think part of the lore is that the, the internment was, was a good time. We didn't have to work. But I think it touched on a really deep emotional pain that my parents never talked about. My mother never talked about the internment experience. The, the only thing that she uh, it was, was recorded her saying was asking my father not to go into the US Army mm -hmm. because he was 37 years old. He didn't have to go but my father insisted on leaving, joining the US Army and uh, leaving the family. I think that scarred my mother and it, it, uh, it stayed with her her whole life. In fact, when I look at pre-war eight millimeter films of the family, I see a young vivacious mother in her twenties with a growing family in a new home and I can remember now as a teenager adult, my mother seemed quiet, reserved, and it's, it's, it's as if, like in that photograph, it changed her whole personality and she carried that for the rest of her life. And my father never talked about uh, the, the internment and the, uh, the pain and suffering that, he, that it inflicted on his family. So it was, it was ex in an exciting time for the, some of the Nisei and especially the Sansei to look squarely at the issue of internment and what it really did to the over 110,000 of the internees. And I wanna ask you both some more questions about redress, but before we move into that, um, one of the things that really struck me about both of your presentations was the photography and the photographs and the ways that you're able to show, you know, your families moving through these different points. So it's clear you've both done a lot of research and I'm wondering what that was like, David, for you to, to find these government photos of your family, what that process was like and, and how, you know, putting these stories together and sort of being the archivist, being the, the storytellers in your families, um, yeah, what that what that has been like for both of you? Um, that's that's a whole different story. <laughs> um, as as I was beginning to research uh, the family story on the internment, I was looking through the archives of the University of California Bancroft Library Collection, and just. Uh, because of the internet, I could access their, their uh, files. And I, I began to find photographs that Mary Ellen, my wife, pointed out those photographs of, are your family. And that photograph of the three boys looking out, out of the train window is in the archives of the, of the Bancroft collection. And the more I looked, the more I found photographs. And these photographs were taken by government photographers. And the way I look at those photographs now is that they were propaganda photographs showing how nice it, were, it was in the camps and how well taken we, we were. And they were used largely for propaganda purposes. Uh, there, there was a, uh, there's a photograph of my, my father and his three brothers who uh, were at the, uh, U.S. Army enlisting, uh, enlisting office, and uh, they were in the process of enlisting. So these these are all propaganda films, uh, move, uh, slides, and photographs. And coincidentally, I was also looking at the internet and found a series of conversations a newspaper editor in Eatonville, Washington, had with my father in 1970. 
And it was in 1974 that uh, my father had gone back to Eatonville and, and visited the office of the Eatonville Dispatch. The editor, Dixie Walters, then wrote about her encounter with my dad and was so excited to, uh, to actually meet some of the former residents of the Japanese village that was on the grounds of the Eatonville Lumber Company. So she and I, I contacted her after reading her article and she and I corresponded and she actually went back to the archives of the Eatonville Dispatch and found all the letters that my father had written from the camps to, to the newspaper. And that's the only voice that I have of my father and his perception, his experiences in these camps. So based on that, I, I began to think more and more about the internment and what it meant personally and to the family and one thing led to another. We, we, uh, I was involved in the establishment of Jane and subsequently with the establishment or the reestablishment of the New England chapter of the JACL because the, uh, the idea was to represent a redress movement in the greater Boston, New England area. Mm. And Margie, before we move into New England specifics here, uh, were the photographs in your presentation, are those family photographs? Are those also government photographs or where did those come from? Uh, some of them were released with the Freedom of Information Act. And, and when that came, you know, we had a lot of camp pictures, but most of the pictures were family pictures. Uh, I was fortunate, my mother had a little bitty suitcase about the size of a, of a large uh, briefcase and she put all the pictures in it and she took them with her wherever she went. Mm -hmm. And that's how we got a lot of old, I've got, you should see the pictures I have that I can't use. And, uh, but it's great. But um, something David said just sparked a memory. Um, I, I was, as part of interviewing for my family history, by the way, I'm working on my family history and most of my friends know I've been working on it for 30 years. Someday I'm gonna get it finished. Um, but um, there was, oops, there was a story that um, I had heard through one of my cousins, and she said that um, she got married in Manzanar, and that was all she sort of told me, and then she says, I think I was the first marriage in Manzanar, and I, I thought it was maybe she was in her 80s at that point, and I thought maybe her memory was kind of bad, and it was didn't really happen, but um, a friend found some Manzanar newspapers, and then I went online and I found newspapers across the United States, and there were pictures of her getting married and a story about her in the Manzanar newspaper in the camp. And the pictures showed her happily cutting a wedding cake with her husband, and um, and I and it was on a page that was full of pictures of everybody at the camps doing things like dancing playing sports, um, putting out a newspaper, but hers was sort of the, the centerpiece because it was a happy wedding. And this was to show people in Arkansas. I think I saw one Arkansas paper, a Tennessee paper. Maybe there was a Texas one too, where um, it was propaganda from the government telling the world that these Japanese are being treated so well and they're happy where they are. Mm -hmm. It was very interesting, David, very interesting. Right. And I mean, I think part of sort of hearing these stories about Japanese American incarceration during World War II is situating this history within, you know, the United States fighting a fighting the good war and fighting against fascism, et cetera, abroad. And so how to then tell the story of what's happening to this community within the United States. Yeah. I mean, that's that's incredible to find those, those newspapers from around the country like that, Margie. Um, okay, so we've gestured towards this. And one of the things that's so exciting about this conversation is that we're in New England, all, all three of us are in New England. Um, and, you know, thinking about 
the history of Japanese Americans in this region, in this part of the country that we don't often think of having a huge Japanese American population or these ties to the history. And both of you, I think, have some really interesting stories about moving here, coming here. Um, but David, you've gestured towards this a little bit, and I know you have some slides. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what the reaction was like in the 1970s and 80s when you started you know, traveling and, and sharing your family's story and sort of getting the redress movement going here in the greater Boston, New England area? Well, uh, before getting into the uh, telling of the story in a broader sense throughout New England, there was a lot of controversy about what, the, uh, what our people here in New England, Japanese Americans, could do or should do regarding the redress. And the, the issue of joining or rejoining the uh, JACL, the Japanese American Citizens League, which at the time, Mar Marja, you could probably explain more what the JACL is, but it, it did have a somewhat negative connotation at the beginning of World War II, where as an organization, the JACL did not come out very strongly against the, uh, the internment and the illegality of the internment. And so there are some, <clears throat> there were some in, in our community, in the Bo greater Boston community that were quite negative about joining the JACL. And we had a number of meetings, Jane meetings in which the, this, this uh, issue of the JACL was was, was discussed. And I just reread a wonderful letter by uh, a woman by the name of Aiko Adachi, who is now 100 years old and is a friend of Margie's. And she wrote this wonderful expose on why we should join the JACL. And her, her assessment of the Nisei or Sansei uh, Nisei community in Boston was that there was uh, some hesitancy about joining the middle class, about the achievements of these very, very smart people who achieved uh, uh, great greatness in, in the business and community and in the academic world. And so there was a hesitancy because they were still unsure of their, uh, of their achievements. And as a result, they wanted to keep a low profile and you know, say, in a way, not rock the boat, leave bygones be bygones. There was another aspect that people talked about and Ico mentioned is that in New England, there aren't very many Asian, uh, Japanese Americans. In fact, we're, we're sort of a lost tribe <clears throat> amongst all the Caucasians in New England. Uh, and so there was a sense of try, not trying to be too much Japanese or bringing too much attention to us as Japanese, uh, uh, people of Japanese ancestry. And so we, we didn't want to be identified as Japanese Americans. We just wanted to be identified as Americans. But fortunately, it was the younger generation. And if you look through the, 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 the history, the students from Harvard, and especially some key students from Harvard, really pushed the idea of, of forming or reforming the Japanese American Citizen League. And its primary purpose was to tell the incarceration story and to push for redress. And so in the next slide, let's see if we can Deborah, if you can bring up my next slide. Um, one second, please. Uh, I I have to uh, find the the yeah. Google. Okay. So in in the next slide, it illustrates some of the activities of the newly formed JACL okay. of New England, the, the New England chapter of the JACL, and. Um, so if you go to the next slide. So this, this was a hand-drawn map uh, giving directions 
to the June 1978 meeting of the JACL. And the meeting was not only for consciousness raising, but also to have a potluck summer, supper. So food was always an important component of the Jane meeting. And subsequent in, in the summer of 1978, we had a picnic and subsequent meetings well into the fall and the winter of 1978. The last meeting in December of 1978 of Jane, the discussion was, was around the issue of the Japanese American Citizens League. And it was decided to go forward to reform the chapter and to begin an outreach program looking to uh, uh, combine uh, our resources with other Pan-Asian groups, such as the uh, Asian American Resource Workshop in downtown Boston and Chinatown and other, other supportive groups. So we had a number of activities sponsored by the JACL as shown in the next slide. There was uh, a, a very uh, vigorous meeting in 1980 uh, held at the Quaker Meeting House in, in Cambridge. Uh, where the whole issue of the incarceration of Japanese Americans and it's the case where redress was part of the program. And it was also a chance for some of the survivors of the camp to talk of their experience. In the next slide, we reached out even further to participate in the uh, Day of Remembrance for, for um, uh, Remembrance of the Internment Ship and also uh, one of our activities was to uh, put on a play written by a local playwright, Rosanna Alfaro, and it was called Don't Fence Me In. Uh, this play was read uh, at the Cambridge Center for Adult Education, as well as performed in, in a number of theaters. And we're really privileged to have uh, Rosanna Alfaro on this on this Zoom meeting. So, so thank you, Rosanna, for, for your wonderful work. So let's see what the next slide has. Uh, let's, let's go back to the uh, previous slide. And uh, so in 1981, the uh, the chapter was quite instrumental in bringing the a commission on redress to hold hearings in, in Boston. And the Harvard University with the support of uh, President Derek Bach was responsible for hosting the uh, commission hearing. And we had uh, notable professors uh, testifying before the commission, talking about the monetary redress that would be necessary, the legal, constitutional, and the psychological impact of the, uh, of the internment. There were no personal uh, testimonies, but only testimony by, by experts. So in 1980, uh, as, as uh, Margie indicated, uh, by the late 1980s, the uh, redress movement cul cul culminated in uh, a bill signed by President Reagan authorizing a repayment redress of $20,000 and a letter that was sent to all the survivors. And here's a copy of my letter. And it was signed by George Herbert Walker Bush dated October 1980. And it basically apologized for the, uh, what had happened during the internment. So that's the uh, end of my story. I just wanted to conclude that Subsequent to the redress, the sending of letters, there was a further movement largely led by the Sanse to, uh, to um, have the internment camps designated as national historic sites. And Minidoka was one of the first to be named as a national historic site. And it was, uh, it was established by executive order by President, then President Bill Clinton, Clinton, and I was privileged to be in the East Room of the White House on the last week of President Clinton's 
uh, uh, term uh, where he uh, signed into law the establishment of Minidoka National Historic Site. And uh, as a result, there have been numerous pilgrimage, pilgrimages to the historic site. And here's a photograph uh, taken at one of the very first. And the pilgrimages are really important for the survivors because it offers a, a, a vehicle for healing, for renewal, and for uh, teaching uh, the younger generation the, uh, the messages of the internment. So the, this is a very important activity now held at the National Historic Site. So that's it for me. I mean, I have probably 20 more questions to ask you about all of that, David, but um, I know we are, we're getting close to time and um, I wanna be respectful of, of everyone's Saturdays, but thank you for sharing that history, David. I think one question I have for both of you as we near wrapping up, um, is what redress meant to you? Uh, Margie, you talked about this a little bit with your the beautiful story about your mother leaving the check near, near your father to make sure that he knew about this and knew about the apology. But for both of you who were, you know, David, you were a young child, Margie, you were a baby in camp. What did that apology letter mean for you and the check mean for you? Oh, Margie, you're muted. Um, you know, what's interesting, I, because I, because maybe I was a baby and everything, it was, it was sort of like, wow, I got $20,000, but what it's meant now, because, uh, when we started getting our checks, it was just about the time they were trying to build the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles. And I know a lot of people donated sums of money to the museum. My mother did, I did. And to see the museum there now, so that I know things, the history of the Japanese Americans are not, is not gonna go away. Uh, in a way that makes me very happy. And, and I know that a lot of the redress money went to help build it. Um, personally, I guess if I was older, I would feel vindicated about what happened to me and, and, and feel like it, it was it was needed, but um, but truly to say I feel that I don't. It, it uh, I think maybe to David it would be more because he remembers everything. Uh, I don't remember anything until we moved to Chicago. <laughs> then then my memory kicks in about what was happening and and it had nothing to do with the camps. But um, I'm going to turn it back to David because I I can't answer that very well. Well, Aaron, I have so many stories I want to tell. And uh, if you would allow me to tell just one story mm -hmm. about, uh, about the establishment of the Minidoka National Historic Site. Um, as you know, uh, my son Dan worked in the White House and was, was partially responsible along with many other supporters in getting this, the, uh, the, the bill signed, the executive order signed and, and uh, the park established but he needed one supporter within the White House to help him push it over the, uh, the, the goal line. And that supporter turned out to be John Podesta, mm. who was chief of staff. And John said, when he heard the story, he said, I know all about it because I grew up in the north side of Chicago. I, knew, I know all about the Japanese American community mm. and the internment. So, it was John Podesta and his experience with Marjor Margie's family and, and neighbors that helped push it over the line. But as, as far as the letter is concerned, when I give my talk to high school, college, law professors, whomever will hear my story, I'll ask them, what would you take, the letter of apology or the 20,000 if you had a choice? And most of the kids, and I, I had to point out that you could barely buy a, 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 electric, a, a Prius or a car for 20,000. And most, uh, when I started, 
most of the uh, students would take the money. Uh, now, when I'm talking, many of the students will, will take the letter. And I would take the letter because it's, it's a formal apology from the highest level. And the an apology is, is very important because I think it helps to heal the wounds that people never talked about. David, I have to do a second to that because I think if my father were still alive and, and he was offered either one, he would probably take the letter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd like to point out when I show the letter, it was signed by George Herbert Walker Bush. And you may not agree with some of his politics, but he was man enough to sign it. Mm. And, and a leader of this country signed it. Well, I wanna thank you both so much for this time. As we learned when we did our practice conversation, we could probably stay on for several more hours, <laughs> but we won't, but just thank you so much, Margie and David for sharing. Um, and for really, I feel like I learned so much and just am feeling very moved um, having listened to your story. So thank you. A huge thank you to Deborah and the Museum of Work and Culture for inviting us and, and making this space. And thank you so much folks who listened and joined and asked some questions. I'm sorry, we didn't get to your questions, but um, thank you so much. And I hope everyone has a really wonderful rest of the weekend. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for Aaron. Thank you again. I could not have done this show or any of these programs without you. And again, uh, also thank you. Uh, thank you, Margie. Thank you, David. Um, please let me know if you can come visit the show. Yes, come to Rhode Island. I'll go. I'll meet you there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to stop recording. Yeah. The button.